And as, uh, as promised, we're back in Daniel chapter 6 today. I didn't quite finish this up last week. We will finish it up today, I promise. In fact, it'll probably be fairly short. I know everybody always say, well, yeah, I've heard that before. Well, uh, actually, I'm going to be fairly short today. Uh, but I want to jump back into Daniel chapter 6. There's probably not uh, too many stories in the Bible that are much better known than Daniel in the lion's den. Right? Uh, even people that are not familiar with church typically are familiar with this story and how God delivered Daniel. Well, we're, we're studying some of the nuances of that chapter and some of the things that led into it. And I just want to remind you, just to keep everything in context of where we're at in our study, because historical context is very important. This is not just some myth, it's not just some legendary story, but this actually fits right into history. We've been studying about Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon, or really the world empire of Babylon, and its development, and then ultimately its fall to the Medo-Persian Empire. And so we've considered that uh, Darius, the, uh, the Mede, he came in and he took the kingdom of Babylon. He captured the actual city of Babylon that was thought to be impenetrable. Um, just a phenomenal historical account. You can study it yourself. You can see the, the Bible history that fits right in with that. Very interesting. Um, but, uh, but that was part of God's judgment against Babylon for their wickedness, for their abuse of God's people. And, then, uh, and so the, the Medo-Persian Empire is now in power. Tremendously powerful empire in the world's history. That tremendous <laughs> debauchery and, and wickedness and sin and abuse that took place in that empire as well. Well, Daniel's been the constant through all of that, hasn't he? From, uh, from, uh, from the captivity of Israel, of Jerusalem's fall, into Babylon, and then through 70 years, uh, or almost 70 years of history as Babylon's ruled over Israel, um, Daniel's been there. We've seen kings come and kings go throughout our study, Nebuchadnezzar, um, we've seen uh, Belshazzar, and a lot of the different guys that were in the interim between those two, and then ultimately now Darius the Mede. And so Daniel's been a constant throughout world empires, throughout different kings, and our theme throughout all has been God's constant rule over this world. It doesn't matter how powerful, humanly speaking, the, the rulers are, or how powerful, humanly speaking, different nations are. God's in control of all of them. And it's absolutely nothing for him to step in and intervene in history. And he has on a very regular basis throughout history, though we often don't recognize it. And so we're trying to, to open our minds to that and understand the spiritual warfare that goes on behind the scenes that maybe we're not cognizant of because we're just not very attuned to the spiritual world. We're very attuned to the physical world and all of our wants and needs here, but there are some great spiritual battles that are raging. So as we entered into Daniel chapter 6, we saw in verses 1 through 9 a real picture of spiritual warfare. And remember, Daniel is there. He's serving in the Persian Empire now as an old man in his 80s at this point in time. But he's so well known for his character and for his integrity and for his strong leadership and his willingness to speak the truth that Darius, the, the king, the emperor, he said, this is the guy that I need to oversee my whole expanse of empire. And remember, there, there are provinces that stretch from, from Libya and Africa all the way to India and then all the way north into modern-day Turkey. I and mean, this was a massive empire, sprawling empire across three continents. And so, um, well, because there are these, uh, what did it say, 120 um, rulers that are set up over those various provinces across that empire, Darius, um, so that he wasn't taken advantage of, so these different rulers weren't trying to undercut his power, he appointed three presidents over all of that to oversee it. Then ultimately, one man, Daniel, to oversee those three and to report directly to the king. Well, <clears throat> all those fellows didn't like that very much, and, um, and they did not want to respond to Daniel uh, maybe these were guys that had been in power in the Babylonian Empire, and they knew of Daniel as well. But at any rate, they decide to undercut him. And as they look for some way that they can accuse Daniel to King Darius, it says that they could find absolutely nothing. And ultimately, they, they conferred amongst themselves and said, the only way that we're going to find a way to undercut Daniel and to try to eliminate him from his position of power is if we find it concerning the law of his God, his worship in some way. So they go and they butter up King Darius Oh, king, live forever. You're a great king, blah, 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 all this different stuff. And ultimately, they said, we want to make a, a new law. 
And this is a temporary thing that's just for 30 days. Nobody can make a petition of or pray to any other man or any other God except for you because, well, you're the greatest ruler in the world's history and everybody should worship you, King Darius. Well, his ego was, uh, was appropriately um, stoked and so he said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Let's do that. And so he signs this law into, or this, this uh, decree into law. And when Daniel heard about it, um, remember what it said he did. He went straight home. Just he didn't try to make a big, uh, big show of this. It wasn't a bunch of pomp and um, arrogance on his part. He wasn't trying to make a political statement or a splash. But he went straight in to his house as he did before. It says and prayed three times a day with his windows open towards Jerusalem. Again, he's not trying to make a public statement here, but that had been his practice for all his life. And what had made him the man that he was was his close walk with God, his prayer, his appreciation of God's word. And so he continued that. He's a bold man. He didn't fear. He wasn't worried about what was going to happen. But the decree that Darius had written said, if anybody violates this law, they're going to be cast into a den of lions and eaten alive. Now, the, the kings in those days frequently kept lions because well, lion hunting was the sport of kings. And the kings would go out and they would hunt for these lions. And, and they also used these lions frequently to dispose of um, unwanted people in the king's court. And so that's what's going to happen here. And so we jump back into Daniel chapter 6. And I was just trying to catch you up on all that. It probably would have been quicker just to read it out of the Bible. But we're in verse 16. And so, um, so the, uh, the, the rulers that hated Daniel, well, of course, they were watching for him to pray. They knew he was going to do that because he was a sincere godly man. And as soon as they, I mean, they're there spying around his house. Ah, all right. He went straight in there and he prayed. And so they go march into King Darius and said, hey, the law of the Medes and the Persians is unchangeable. Even the king can't revoke the law once it's been made. That was their policy. And that Daniel of the children of the captivity of Israel has violated your law. And now you have to follow through on what you said and feed him to the lions. Well, Darius was extremely upset. Immediately he knew the scheme that these guys had plotted because he knew they wanted to get rid of Daniel. And so he worked, it says, tirelessly all day long trying to find a way out of that, trying to... Uh, trying to circumvent that law. And they came back in, uh, again, accusatory before Darius and said, King, you better know this. You cannot change the law. Do what you said. And so Darius had to do that. And so in verse 16, it says, Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. He knew something about Daniel, and he knew something about the, the history and the power of Daniel's God. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet. That is his own ring, his seal. And with the signet of his lords, and the, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace, and he passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him. His sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning. Now, you got to know that for, for this, uh, this, this world ruler, this is a pretty significant event. I mean, he, he, he can't sleep. He's worked all day. He's staying up all night, troubled by what he had done. He knew it was wrong. He understood that. And he's genuinely worried for Daniel. And so the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice. You notice what his expectation was. Daniel's going to be gone. He cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said unto Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living, um, the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel. And has shut the lion's mouths, and they have not hurt me. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, I have done no hurt. And so he reminds him, hey, not only did, did God notice my innocency and that I've done nothing wrong, but I've only done right. I've not done anything wrong to you either, king. Understand this, that I was falsely accused. 
Then was the king exceeding glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. Well, we'll stop right there, and we'll read the last couple of verses here in a few minutes. But, uh, but I want to remind you, we can see, uh, as we break down this chapter, uh, this, this study of Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, you can very clearly see a depiction of spiritual warfare, the, the, the uh, kingdom of darkness and of Satan that is warring against God. And warring against God's people and doing everything it can to undercut and undermine and disparage God and those who follow him. That's something that's very real in our lives, folks. Again, we may not be very cognizant of it, but the closer we get to the Lord, the more that we serve him, the more we will realize what a battle we're in as the war or as the world wars against us. Um, we can see Daniel's decisiveness. In being willing to stand for God and to stand alone, even though we don't see that anybody else does in the kingdom at that time. We can see the king's response here. And um, Daniel, as compared with the king, Daniel's in perfect calmness even in the face of death. He welcomed the challenge and we've mentioned that everything in his life, all the trials, all the difficulties and temptations that he's gone through... From the beginning of Dan the book of Daniel all the way through this point, he doesn't see those as isolated incidents, but this is a continual character development and spiritual strengthening for him to lead him to this final great trial in his life. And he recognized that. So he didn't shirk the difficulties. He didn't whine and mourn about them, but he saw this as an opportunity to stand for God. And I appreciate that. And so he looked at it in that way. And so when this one came, final uh, major trial or temptation that he's uh, that he's thrown into, he doesn't even hesitate. He's absolutely decisive. He's absolutely calm. And despite the king's seal being put on the lion's den, saying, "Hey, he's under death sentence. Nobody can rescue him." But well, we can see the clear contrast of God's greater power, and God says, "Yeah, right, buddy. I can rescue him. This is not a problem for me at all. My power far exceeds." The power of this mightiest kingdom on earth. And so we can see God's response here in verses 18 through 28. And we see God's, God's verdict about this situation and how it was going to play out. Now, there, there's a picture, a great picture of God's control that's laid out before us. And we've seen this as the theme of the book of Daniel. And we continue to see it emphasized for us here. God's sovereignty, his control, his power over all the things of the world is once again displayed. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned this a moment ago, but in this portion of scripture that we're looking at this morning to sum up this chapter, we can see it clearly portrayed again in verses 19 through 21 that we just read. Again, notice the contrast between King Darius and Daniel. The king arose very early in the morning. He went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel, and the king spoke and said to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? <laughs> what a question. Um, yeah, he is hands down. It says, Then said Daniel unto the king, O oh, king, live forever. Now, that's the same response that the, uh, that the other leaders, the other lords, the other presidents had made before King Darius. And that was a very normal response uh, of a, a courtier who was in the presence of the king in those days. O king, live forever. Well, here's, here's the king. He's fretting. He's worried. He's pacing the floor in his palace all night long. And here's Daniel in complete composure. Uh, as if he's an ambassador, just getting ready to walk into the United Nations or into some other great authority, some other great body. Daniel's composure is in stark contrast to Darius' anxiety. And I hope that you guys are, are really getting this picture driven home to your hearts. All the things that this world has to throw at us as God's people are not things that should rattle us. They shouldn't shake us. They shouldn't worry us. We, we should not be the picture of this Darius who's, who's pacing around worried and anxious and out of his mind fretting. Because he has no concept of God who can be in control over these situations. Daniel had absolute confidence in God's control. And there's not an ounce of worry in his life that we can see projected here. Not in his words, not in his actions, not in his thoughts. 
It's a, a very clear contrast for us between the peace of heart, the peace of mind that comes from being one of God's servants, from being in God's kingdom, and the lack of peace that people have in this world who don't know the Lord. Now, now listen, I, I understand here through this passage and through history that Darius really, really liked Daniel. I mean, it, it comes through very clearly. He had genuine concern and care for him. Not only has he appointed him to be the number one ruler in his kingdom, just under the king, um, but, but he's, he's so worried for his safety. Uh, he, he's so worried. And I understand that it's, it's often harder to watch somebody that you love suffer than to be the one that actually suffers yourself. And I understand what kind of anxiety there is for someone that you love, particularly when you're the guy who goofed up and brought on this suffering. And Darius understands all of that. And I don't want to be unfair to him. Um, I have no doubt that if my close friend had been in the lion's den, I probably would have been fretting just like him. I probably would have been tremendously worried. But this is really designed, and this whole circumstance is oriented to show us the powerlessness of the kings of this world. No matter how mighty and powerful they are in the sight of men, but the pow their powerlessness and the calmness that the child of God can have in the same crisis. There's no comparison between the two. It's stark contrast, isn't it? Very clear. Well, notice two things in verses 22 and 23. Daniel, when he responds to Darius, says, My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Daniel says that the reason why God has delivered me is because I was innocent before him, and I was innocent before you. Now, had I, have been, uh, had, had I been unfaithful to my God, he would have had reason to strike me down or to let me suffer this judgment, but I was faithful. That's basically what Daniel's saying. He's teaching Darius a lesson here, even in this situation, as he's talking to, to Darius from the pit of this lion's den, with the lions sitting all around him. Daniel is not claiming um, to be sinless here. Understand that, all right? Um, but he's, he's just very clearly pointing out, I'm innocent, even though your henchmen wanted me to be unfaithful to my God. Daniel's not claiming to be Sinless, he's not claiming that he's never done anything wrong, but he's really saying in the heat of the moment, I chose faithfulness to God, and I'm innocent before him. I didn't do anything wrong in this circumstance before God, and furthermore, King, I didn't do anything wrong to you either. Your henchmen, these, these bureaucrats that are trying to undercut your power, they've accused me of not having respect for you by violating this law. That couldn't be further from the truth. Darius knew that, by the way, and Daniel is reiterating that to him, but he's also really trying to emphasize that no one has precedence over his God and over his faithfulness to God. No matter what people in this world may say, no matter what authorities may say, God's people better stand up for what's right. They better do what's right. They better stand for him. But the next verse tells us something else. It adds something else. It says... Um, the, and and the, the text tells us, Then was the king exceedingly glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. It's interesting. I think that that's a, a pretty, a, almost a reflection of what had happened when his three friends, remember they had been thrown into the fiery furnace under Nebuchadnezzar's reign. They said, hey, we don't have to even think about what to respond here. We're not going to worship your idol." We worship God. We don't worship man-made idols. And so Nebuchadnezzar is full of rage, remember, absolutely out of control. And he has them stoke this furnace up that they've been using to smelt the gold down to build that idol. And, uh, and they come out of there unscathed. And it says that there was no harm on them. Not even the, the smell of smoke on their clothes. And God delivered them from that. And Nebuchadnezzar had been mesmerized. He'd been fascinated by this miracle that had taken place. And we can see the same thing here. 
There's no manner of hurt found on Daniel at all. Well, on the one hand, Daniel says, the Lord spared me because I was innocent before him and before you. And on the other hand, the, the Bible text tells us that Daniel was spared because of his faith in God. Daniel's faith, his trust in the Lord, is what saved him here. And Daniel's trust in God was the instrument by which he received the, the deliverance and the blessing of God in this passage. Now I want to say that um, it's going to be the same for you and I on Judgment Day. When the Lord Jesus stands you before the throne of God on Judgment Day, and the accusations start to come. If you genuinely know and obey the Lord, you're going to be vindicated on two different fronts. First of all, you're going to be declared and found to be actually innocent on all charges brought against you. Um, because, I mean, at that point in time, we'll be glorified. There will be no evil in us. But specifically, you also have been justified by the grace of God through Jesus' sacrifice. And at the same time, the basis of your, <clears throat> of your salvation, the basis of your redemption, will be the work that Christ has done on your behalf and that you've received by faith, by trust in Him. And so on that, that double ground, you'll have a vindication yourself on Judgment Day as you stand before God. So Daniel's words here in verses 22 and 23, they're really a picture of all those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. When Satan accuses you, well, you'll be found innocent because of your trust in Christ who paid for your sins and washed your sins away. In verse 24, we see the, uh, the dark side come through of Daniel's deliverance. Not dark on his part, but let's continue reading. And the king commanded. Now Daniel's immediately brought up out of that pit, out of the lion's den. The king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel. And they cast them into the den of lions. Them, their children, and their wives. And the lions had the mastery of them and broke all their bones in pieces before ever they came to the bottom of the den. It's not a very pretty picture that we can see taking place there. The king is furious with those who had maliciously gone after Daniel. And even though he couldn't do anything about it when the law was signed because he himself had signed it and the Medo-Persian rule was, well, you can't change the law. Well, he'd done his um, obligation before the law. The judgment was they have to be thrown into a lion's den. Daniel was thrown into a lion's den. Daniel was pulled out of the lion's den because nothing happened <coughs> a day later. And now all these other guys um, get to face Darius's wrath. Well, because he knew right from the start that these guys were just devious and that they had intentionally established this law and, by the way, had lied to the king. Because remember, remember their accusation or their, their, their suggestion before the king. All of the leaders have got together and come up with this resolution. Well, that wasn't true because the leader of all those leaders, Daniel, hadn't been present. He certainly had not agreed to that law. And so now judgment falls on them and not only on them, but also on their wives and their children, their entire families, um, they're thrown into the lion's den as well. I certainly am not going to glorify this part of the story. And I don't think that any of us should either. Um, but what a shake-up in the kingdom. Wow. I mean, here we have all, all these are the leaders of the entire Medo-Persian Empire. I don't know how many of them there were, but I imagine that the large majority, if not all of them, other than Daniel, were out for his blood. And, um, and so they're destroyed. Now, by the way, I want you to know that this is not something that Daniel asked for. We don't see any kind of hint of that at all. This pagan king, he's not filled with the mercy that's manifested in a godly king like David. But even in this horrible act of retribution and vengeance and violence, we see a picture of evil being redirected um, back onto the heads of those who attempted to use evil for their own ends. And there's some kind of ugly justice that's done here in that sense. Now, let me, uh, well, I'll get to this in a minute. But no matter what you face, folks, how you're wronged, how you're maligned, how you're mistreated, 
Let me make this point as we kind of summarize and close this chapter out. Leave vengeance up to God. Let him take care of it. He teaches us in his word that it's not up to us to seek retribution. It's not up to us to seek revenge or to seek vengeance. Now, I'm not trying to, um, to, uh, to, to speak to you and say that there shouldn't be justice served. Because of all people, we shouldn't just be some wishy-washy, milk-toast individuals as Christians who, who are so um, touchy-feely that, well, you know, uh, everybody just deserves mercy and grace and there's no uh, justice that should be served when wrong is done. No, the Bible teaches that very clearly. I'm not the instrument of revenge, though, in most cases. God can take care of it. And so we should demand justice. We should require justice when it comes to our criminal justice system, when it comes to any... Um, uh, avenue that we have that God has um, invested in us to maintain that responsibility. But when it comes to these types of things, well, it's certainly not our job, unless we're well, placed in that position to be an executioner or something. It's not our job to, to exact vengeance. And God says this, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Well, that's reiterated for us in the Old Testament, it's reiterated for us in the New Testament. It's a theme throughout all the Bible. David learned um, this very lesson. If you take the time to read through the book of 1 Samuel, we've been, we've been studying and reading through that in our family devotions. But he learned this um, uh, on a very personal level. As he is chased by King Saul for years on a daily basis. And King Saul is hunting for his life and wants to destroy him. For no fault of David's at all, David waits on God over and over again to avenge him. He didn't take that into his own hands um, like some kind of a vigilante justice, despite being urged to do so by his closest friends and associates, despite there actually being opportunity several times for him to exact vengeance on Saul, he didn't do it. On one occasion, interestingly enough, David finally did get angry, and he wanted to bring revenge on somebody who had wronged him. And he nearly killed a huge number of innocent people as a result. You can read about that um, with uh, him in the story of Nabal and his family. Well, God kept him from his purpose. Um, kept him, by, his, by David's own words, from a great sin that he recognized he would have done. We, you and I, can trust God. And, go, and we can wait on Him to right the wrongs. And just as God dealt with this by removing King Saul from office and removing Dave, or Daniel's antagonists here, in the end, that's what's going to happen to everyone who opposes the kingdom of God as well. The evil that they have manifested and reflected and used, well, it's going to recoil against them and they're going to be destroyed. Well, finally, in verses 25 through 27, we close this out by looking at Darius's confession of God's control. And again, what an amazing testimony it is to see a pagan emperor that acknowledges this himself. We've seen it in the life of Nebuchadnezzar as well. And now we see it in Darius, the Persian ruler. And let me read it to you. Verse 25, it says, Then King Darius wrote unto all people, this is his entire expansive kingdom around the world. All people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. This is his words. Peace be multiplied unto you. Now remember, we, we had a, a personal testimony from Nebuchadnezzar, a whole chapter of the Bible that was written by him, right? As he reflected on what God had done for him. Now we get to see that from this other pagan emperor. I just, I just love that it's included in the Bible. Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree... That in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and steadfast forever. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. An amazing testimony. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And Darius basically says here, um, <clears throat> a mighty fortress is Daniel's God. He rules over all of us, even 
Darius was acknowledging that he, God was greater than him, Darius and these other pagan emperors who were often worshipped as gods. He acknowledges that. And so again, we have for the third time an emperor in the past of this world confessing the absolute control and the reign of the God of Israel. Now, there are so many lessons that we can learn from this passage, and I want to just very, very succinctly summarize in maybe one sentence each a few of those lessons that we see in this that I want you to take away. The, passages, the, the passage here in Daniel chapter 6 is an encouragement to suffering believers in Christ to stand firm no matter what. No question about that. But it's also a call to integrity. To those of us who are hard pressed by the culture around us, no matter what, uh, what area that you're in, whether it's in the education system, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's just in society or the community, we are pressed upon by the culture around us to compromise. And this is a reminder to maintain integrity, to maintain character and stand for the right. It's a reminder that God is in complete control of our situation, no matter where we find ourselves. Because he rules in our lives, in our callings, in our ministries, we can serve him without fear of the consequences as long as we're standing for him. Now, instead of fearing our enemies, instead of fearing those that oppose us, we ought to fear for our enemies. Because we've seen in this picture of, of the lion's den, what's ultimately and sadly going to happen to all those who oppose God. Because God is supreme Lord of all, we ought to trust him, folks. We ought to believe him. We ought to put our faith in him, our confidence in him. Put your faith in the God of Daniel. Stand on his principles of truth, and the Lord's blessings will come, both here in this life and hereafter. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to study your words.